today as we come to the table. We as Christians are challenged as to where we stand and what we believe. Now again, we shouldn't be challenged, but we are challenged in light of many scientific theories that are out there today. And we've talked about it before because again, the wording here in the language speaks of something that happened instantaneously. And as we see, God is going to say, and we're going to see when we get in chapter 2, verse 1, it says when God finished creation, that He was finished. And the word there means done. Nothing else added to it. No gradual increase. No evolving, if you will. And that brings us again to what, again, many of us are challenged with and what we hear today taught in what is called science in the classes, and that is evolution. As Christians, we're frequently tested in our daily lives, whether at work or in our personal lives. When it comes to our belief in God's creation, we tend to doubt it after hearing about evolution from scientists. We seem to accept what the world says about creation rather than what the Bible says. Pastor Mark explains in today's message how God's creation was perfect and did not require evolution to become what it is today and in future. Well, thanks for staying with us today as we come to the table, the daily Bible study program of Pastor Mark Kirk of Calvary Knoxville. When God created everything, He was pleased with His creation and declared it to be perfect. Because you were created in the image of God, you are God's most valuable and perfect creation. Now, let's join Pastor Mark in the book of Genesis chapter 1 with today's edition of Come to the table. Why don't we open up our Bibles to Genesis chapter 1. As we continue through the book of Genesis and looking at creation. And today what we're going to delve into is creation day 5. We'll cover all of day 5, but we're only going to get into a part of day uh, 6, land animals in chapter 6. We're not going to get into the part of God creating man because there's so much there. As I begin to study it and think about how it pertains to where we are and, and modern science and all the things that are out there, I felt like we needed to slow down and take some more time on that, so we're going to do that. But today we're going to look specifically at, again, fully day five and part of day six. But why don't we read together, starting in verse 20, and we'll read the verses and then go back and look at it more in depth. Notice it says, Then God said, Let the waters abound with an abundance of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the face of of the firmament of the heavens. So God created great sea creatures and every living thing that moves with which the waters abounded according to their kind and with every winged bird according to its kind and God saw that it was good. And God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. So the evening and the morning were the fifth day. Then God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind. Cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth, each according to its kind, and it was so. And God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. Father, we thank you, Lord, for, again, getting into your word. And this is where we find life. Lord, your word tells us that your word is a lamp unto our feet. It's a light unto our path. And Lord, as we look at creation and we look at the glory and the wonder around us and all that you've done, Lord, we need your word to clarify just exactly what it means to us. And Lord, we can see its splendor, we can see its beauty, but we pray now that by your spirit, Lord, you'd let us see even more, Lord, your creation in an intimate fashion. And so I ask God now that you would pour out your spirit on us. I pray that you would teach us by the power of the Holy Spirit. I ask that you would just minister to our hearts. And Lord, although we're looking specifically at creation, and we're learning facts and knowledge about your word, and, and Lord, even some things scientifically. Father, we pray that you would minister in a personal way in our heart today. We're not here, Lord, just to learn about facts and to gain knowledge, although that's part of it. We want to know you. Lord, as Paul said, to know you, Lord, everything else is considered rubbish compared to knowing you. 
And so let us know you this morning. Let your spirit so fill us and so permeate our heart. Lord, that we leave here filled with joy and worshiping our God with a renewed splendor and wonder at just your greatness. So we love you, Lord, and we ask you to do a great work for your namesake. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, like I said, today we look at uh, day five and part of day six. Next week we'll go on into looking at God creating man and all that goes with that. And uh, so why don't we just start right in. The first thing we're going to look at here beginning with chapter, or rather verse 20 is uh, day five, sea creatures and birds. Notice what it says. It says, then God said, let the waters abound with an abundance of living creatures and let the birds fly above the earth across the face of the firmament of the heavens. Now this is an interesting verse, specifically because of the word abound. Notice he says, let the seas abound with these creatures. It comes with the idea of instantaneous filling of the oceans. In other words, it was as if God spoke. It wasn't as if. It says God spoke and boom, everything was there. The oceans were filled. And note this, all the different creatures were there and teeming with life. It gives this, again, the word means to team or to swarm or to multiply. It doesn't give a picture at all here of a gradual increase. As a matter of fact, it just says God just did it. And the oceans around the earth were just teeming with life. This excitement of his creation and all these creatures that were moving around in the waters. And again, when we look at Genesis chapter 1, and we've talked about this, we as Christians are challenged as to where we stand and what we believe. Now again, we shouldn't be challenged, but we are challenged in light of many scientific theories that are out there today. And we've talked about it before because again, the wording here in the language speaks of something that happened instantaneously. And as we see, God is going to say, and we're going to see when we get in chapter 2, verse 1, it says, when God finished creation, that he was finished. And the word there means done. Nothing else added to it. No gradual increase. No evolving, if you will. And that brings us again to what, again, many of us are challenged with and what we hear today taught in what is called science in the classes, and that is evolution. And again, we've talked about it as we've gone through these different days where God has created, but it seems that with each verse, we uncover a new part of the scriptures that makes evolution impossible. And again, that would be this. According to the evolutionary theory, it was this started with this ooze and this one cell, and again, gradually became all that it is, basically out of nothing, with no force really driving it other than just it happened. But God says, no, I created it, and I didn't start it out gradual and let it grow into something. I did it, fully complete, fully finished, and fully done. And again, that's what he's talking about here, and that's what the word here means, to abound. It's interesting, when you look at the scientific evidence, and that's, you know, again, I'm no scientist, I know, but there's one thing I do I've kind of found as a hobby horse, because again, being someone who believes in the word of God and holds the word of God up as his standard, you know, it tells us in the Psalms that God holds his word even higher than his name. And if God holds his word even higher than his name, and his name is the name above all names, how high must his word be? And so someone who sees that in the scriptures and says, all right, God, you hold your word higher than even your name. If you say this is the way it happened, I believe that. And as I began over the years to delve into the scientific evidence, I began to find that there was no scientific evidence for evolution. That's why they called it a theory. And again, basically, when you look at what God's word says, and then you look at the evidence, it all lines up perfectly. You know, we see God says that he created them, and they were teeming, they were complete in their their fullness at that time. As we get later, we'll see that. But I think that even before we go farther, guys, we need to know this as believers. And this is something that I guess I didn't understand until later. But again, you need to understand that when it comes to the evolutionary theory, there is not one single transitional bone in existence. Out of thousands and even millions of fossils and bones across the face of this planet, there is not one that a scientist can hold up and say, here is a transitional bone that shows that one animal moved from one thing to another. And again, we're going to get into this whole process where God says he created them after their kind, according to their kind, after their kind. And it's amazing when you read even the evolutionary scientists, when they try to say, yes, evolution happened. I was reading one just yesterday that said, if we didn't know that evolution was a fact, you would think that all this stuff just happened the way it was and started like it is. Now, isn't that amazing? Now, now grab that for a minute. What the scientist is saying is, when I look at the evidence, it tells me that this just started completed as it was at the beginning that it didn't evolve or or move into anything, and we have no fossils to prove that. But since we know that it did, wink, wink, nod, nod, right? Therefore, it can't be. So therefore, even though we can't find these missing links and these bones, therefore we know. Guys, understand this. If evolution were true, we would have not thousands, but probably millions of transitional bones right now in our museums. You can't find one. 
And that's what drives the evolutionary scientists crazy. All they can do is teach what they believe and go on theory and on faith. They have to say, by faith, we believe this happened. And by faith, we trust that this took place. And they've been successful in convincing and deceiving a society at large in it. And what I find exciting is when we look at the, the fossil record, you know, let the facts speak for themselves. Remember the old dragnet shows, you know, just the facts, ma'am. If we just lay out the facts of the fossil record, no one could ever get evolution from that, ever. You have to simply lay them out and say, you know what? This just looks like it was a horse, and a horse was a horse is a horse. And this looks like it was a dog, and it's still a dog. And that looks like it was a cat, and that's still a cat. Nothing has changed. And that's what's important about this, because as God says here in his word, you know, that they abounded, it gives this picture of he created it, completed it, and there they were. There was nothing to change into or to evolve into. And again, as we go through these verses, we're going to see over and over the Lord continuing to say and to emphasize according to its kind. And remember, there's never been any type of creature that has changed from its kind to another kind. We talked a couple of weeks ago about that. Cats are still cats, dogs are still dogs. Nothing has changed, and that is what God's Word bears out. That is what the evidence bears out, and we'll see that even more as we work through this. But notice here, he goes on in verse 21 and says, So God created great sea creatures and every living thing that moves with which the waters abounded, according to their kind, there's that phrase, And every winged bird, according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. Now notice God says it's good. He doesn't say, I started it, and now it's got to evolve into something good. I created it. It's good. Now it's interesting here, and I want to point this out for something we'll talk about a little bit later. And that is, we see all the sea creatures, all every living thing, he says there, that moves in the waters. God created. But there's an interesting word here. He says, so God created great sea creatures. Now, Again, one of the translations of that word could be sea creature. That's accurate. But there's also another translation of this word that's used in large part, and it's the word dragon. In other words, you could honestly, with honest exegesis and with honestly using the word there in the Hebrew, you could say, so God created great dragons in the sea, if you will. Now, again, that's going to be important for a moment. We're not going to get into that now. Uh, But again, I wanted you to to point that out so that when we get to the end of the study, you're going to see why I brought that up. But again, speaking here of the great sea creatures, again, the whales and all the different things that were created as God created everything that moved within uh, the seas. Now again, we see here a completed work, a good work, and again, the phrase according to its kind showing us that God kept everything the way he wanted and it still stayed that way today. Nothing changes even today. We know that. And notice it says in verse 22, and God blessed them. Now, I've never noticed that before. That grabbed my attention. God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters of the sea, and let the birds multiply on the earth. Now, this is interesting to me, because notice God blessed the fish and the birds. We don't think about God blessing the fish and the birds, do we? Do you think about God blessing the animals? I mean, God created them and said, hey, bless them. Now, I don't know what that all encompassed. I know he gave them the ability to reproduce and to fill the earth, but he also gave them a blessing. He put a blessing upon them. And I find that interesting because, again, I believe we as Christians are also to be a blessing to God's creation. Now, there's a misbalance here that's often done. People begin, as it says in Romans, it tells us that many people worship the creature rather than the creator. And that, of course, is in error. We're never to put God nowhere in Scripture puts animals above man, you know, it's amazing when you go to Maine, if you were to go and catch your Maine lobster and say you love lobster and you could do that or you go get one, if you find out that that lobster is pregnant and you don't let it go free, you could, it's my understanding, I know you can be fine, but maybe even worse. You know, possible jail time for things like that, but certainly a fine either way. And yet, you know, if you go to an eagle's nest and take the egg or take a feather, then you can be fined for that and all these penalties they bring on you for these things. And yet... You can take a baby child and terminate its life. And people say not a word. And so you see what happens is oftentimes people and man on his own without God begins to worship the creature rather than the creator and will actually take the creature and elevate it above the creator and and elevate it above the word of God. We're not to do that. But at the same time, I do find it interesting that the Bible says that we're to take care of our animals, that we're to love them. They're a blessing. God has blessed them. And again, specifically speaking of the fish and birds, I, I don't know that he would leave out the others, but I find that interesting that God blessed them. You know, it says in Proverbs 12, 10, a righteous man regards the life of his animal, but the tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. Did you know you can tell a righteous man by how he treats his animals? Isn't that interesting? 
God is so good. We think about God and his love for us, but I think about God and his love for the, you know, when you look at, again, I'm not getting on the animal thing. I mean, I, I, again, man is held above that. And I think there's a detriment out there because we have all this worship of the earth, you know, the earth day and all this worship of animals and people actually lift them up. So I don't want to go too much on this because obviously man is above that. But when you look at these cute little animals, I mean, sometimes you see these cute little things, man, what, what a sweet little animal that is. God does that too. You know, everything he created has a purpose. The Bible says that not even a sparrow falls to the ground. And so again, it shows us that we need to be mindful of these things as well. Again, not putting them over man, but to be mindful of them as God has indeed put his blessing on them too. Notice he goes on here in verse 23 and says, So the evening and the morning were the fifth day. So now we come to a close here at the end of the fifth day. God has created again the the great sea creatures, the things in the ocean, the birds of the air. And now this day comes to a close and it now fades away and now we fade into day six. And now, again, as we get into day six, we look at land animals and man. Again, we're going to cover land animals today, and we'll look at man next week. But notice, he goes right on into it. Notice what it says here in verse 24. Then God said, let the earth bring forth the living creatures according to its kind, cattle and creeping things and beast of the earth, each according to its kind, and it was so. And God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. Now again, I point these things out not to be repetitious, but notice here that God states the land animals were created good from the beginning. There's no mention here of them being partially begun or some kind of ooze that would eventually grow into something. He says, no, I created them, they're complete, they're good, They didn't evolve into anything. And this brings us to a very interesting question. Again, if you believe the word of God, and if you hold God's word as highly as God does, that is above even his very name, he says, then it brings us honestly as Christians here, if we believe the word of God, that God says on this same day he created every single land creature there is. It brings up a question I think that oftentimes many commentators even avoid. And I think we as Christians sometimes stay away from it because we might feel intimidated by what is being taught out there as modern science or what modern science is teaching as fact, which we know is not. But again, that is the question obviously comes up. Mark, what about the dinosaurs? You mean to tell me that man and dinosaurs lived on the earth at the same time, that they roamed the earth at the same time? I don't mean to tell you any such thing, but God does. Because God says here in his word that on the sixth day, he created every single land creature there is. Now, I have a choice. I can either say, yeah, but, you know, he didn't, you know, yeah, but, yeah, but. Well, he didn't create yabbits. That's the thing he didn't create. However, he did create dinosaurs. And he did create them with man. And again, I believe the scripture not only bears that out here, it bears it out in other places that we're going to look at in just a moment. But again, you say this, but Mark, hasn't science proven? Let me just stop right there and say, that's what I used to think until I began to do my own homework. And guess what I have found out? And I'm not scared at all to delve into science in it because I have found out science has not proven any such thing. And I used to be intimidated thinking, well, it's been proven and you can show it scientifically. And now I found out, no, you can't. But they tell you that and they want you to believe it because it's a way to deny God and to somehow say that all this just happened rather than God creating it. Now, you might say, but wait a minute, we had dinosaurs walking with man. I mean, what about these things? They come up and they eat your head off. As the Bible tells us, it sounds like a kid in the backyard, doesn't it? You, know, you can tell I've been there, right? I still shouldn't do that at this age. But anyway, but the bottom line is, here's the bottom line, guys. The Bible says when God created them, they were vegetarians. T-Rex was a vegetarian. Hey, have an apple. You know, I don't know what it was like. But it wasn't until after the fall And it wasn't until after the flood that all these things began to turn. And God never created animals to attack animals and animals to attack people and all these things. This is all a result of the fall. Now, again, we're not going to say that that means that you can be a vegetarian. We're going to get into that later when we get into man. You can be. You're welcome to. But there's nothing wrong in being a meat eater. I mean, some of you guys are T-Rexes right now. I know that. And you're meat eaters out there. I'm one of you. And there's nothing wrong in that. And God blesses that. And your your wife's going, yeah, that describes him. He's a T-Rex, all right. (laughs) You know, (laughs) he devours, you know. But the bottom line is, is that there's nothing wrong in that. We're going to talk about the way God designed it. But originally, God designed that. All creatures, man and animals, were originally vegetarians. And so what that means is, is that the dinosaurs weren't walking around biting people's heads off. And again, after the fall, and again, after all these things began to happen, we know they quickly became extinct. And so therefore, they weren't really that much of a threat to man, except for a short period of man's history. Now, as far as dinosaurs go, there's a lot of different theories. It is something I'll throw out there just for fun for you. One of the things that confused scientists is why dinosaurs had such small lungs. 
And when we get to the flood, we'll talk about this a little bit more because the size of that animal to get the oxygen that it needed to supply its body, some scientists say it was impossible for some of those dinosaurs to have done that. With our current oxygen levels in the atmosphere, they couldn't have lived. Well, what's interesting is, and we talked about this, the canopy that used to surround the earth, when you were here, we talked about, we're going to be talking about when we get to the flood of Noah. Scientists say that if there were a canopy like that, we would have had a much higher oxygen level in our atmosphere substantially higher. And by the way, now inside of rocks, they're finding, and apparently rocks, certain rocks hold oxygen levels from different degrees. I don't understand that. Again, not scientifically, but in the center of some rocks, we find a much higher level of oxygen levels, which scientists say proves that at one time in Earth's history, we had a much higher oxygen saturation in our atmosphere that we do now. And by the way, you think about the healing properties of oxygen. What do the ball players do today when they get hurt? Did you know in the locker rooms they have oxygen masks? And the ball players go in and they breathe oxygen, higher levels of oxygen, because they now know that higher levels of oxygen in the atmosphere brings healing faster to your body. Did you know that? So the athletes have picked up on this. Sports has picked up on it. And now they actually have their athletes breathing the oxygen so they can heal faster and be ready for next week's game, so to speak. Well, guys, can you imagine when God created the healing properties and having more oxygen? And now not only would we heal faster, how much easier it would be to breathe and all these different aspects. What's amazing is, is that with the higher oxygen levels, a dinosaur would not have needed big lungs. And so the question of why their rib cage and their lung capacity is so small is answered in understanding that used to, there was a higher oxygen level before the flood, which is easily explained scientifically, and they wouldn't have needed as much oxygen to survive. And so again, when the flood came, what happened to the dinosaurs? Mark, what happened? Well, guess what? The oxygen levels in our atmosphere dropped. And guess who couldn't breathe good enough to supply their bodies anymore? And guess who slowly begin to die out and now are extinct? So you see, when you begin to understand these things, you begin to delve into it, there's nothing intimidating or fearful about it. It's very understandable, and it lines up perfectly with what we call science today. Now, again, I'm not saying that's the only explanation for what's happened, but I'm saying that's definitely one. And I just want to say, as we get into this whole thing about proving scientifically that the earth is millions of years old or that dinosaurs lived millions of years before man, science does not support it. And as a matter of fact, there's a recent discovery that puts science into question on that. And you haven't heard much about it on your news, and I doubt you will. You may see something about it on one of your documentaries or History Channel type reports, but I wanted to share this with you. This is just in the last few months this has taken place, if I'm not mistaken. I think it's just been in the last few months, but I ran across this article And it's a discovery of a dinosaur bone, a Tyrannosaurus rex. It was discovered by an evolutionist named Dr. Mary Schweitzer. And notice I said she is an evolutionist. She does not believe in the Bible or creation story. She believes that we evolved. What happened was, and I'll read the article after I give you some background, she found a T-Rex, and so in order to get the T-Rex into the helicopter from where they found it, they had to break one of its bones. Now, you know that must have broken her heart. (laughs) You know, somebody finding a T-Rex to break its bones, you want to keep it intact. But they realized they couldn't get it in the helicopter to get it back to the museum to re-put it together if they didn't break the bone. So they broke the bone, and they found an amazing discovery. And let me just read it. The article is entitled, Stunning Blow to Evolutionist's Age-Old Story About Dinosaurs. Isn't it interesting that it only took a couple of chapters in after God created everything for mankind to find a way to rebel? This is human nature, isn't it? Throughout history, God has something great in mind, but people find loopholes and do things their own way, rebelling against God. Something that's striking in the book of Genesis is that God remains faithful even when mankind does not. God keeps his promises when it would be impossible for anyone else to do so. What an amazing God we serve. Pastor Mark has been working his way through the opening book of the Bible, and there's so much more to gain from it. Come to the Table is a radio ministry of Calvary Knoxville. If you're enjoying these teachings, head over to thewaymedia.net to hear more. Just click on the Come to the Table tab. While you're there, if you have any questions or comments about today's message, We'd love to hear them. Just look for the questions and comments link. If you're ever in the Knoxville, Tennessee area, we'd love for you to drop in and see us. You can find service times and locations on thewaymedia.net. Scroll to the bottom of the page and find a link to Calvary Knoxville. We have several service times that could accommodate whatever type of schedule you have. We're so thankful that you've joined us today, listening to Pastor Mark's thoughts and insights on the book of Genesis. 
There's more to learn and appreciate from the beginning of the Bible on. So come next time, grab your Bible, maybe a cup of coffee, and be ready to understand the great things God has for you to learn the next time we come to the table. Come to the Table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary Knoxville.